Hello and welcome everyone. I am uh, Ioana Dima West, Senior Manager in the Science Natural Perils team at AXA Excel, a division of AXA focusing on both insurance and reinsurance of corporate accounts. Welcome to the Masterclass on Climate and Wildfires brought to you by the AXA Research Fund. A reminder that this session will be recorded and will be made available at a later time. And also please remember to turn off your mic and camera. We will welcome in a moment Dr. Apostolos Bulgarakis, an atmospheric scientist specializing in wildfire research, who has been leading the AXA Research Chair in Wildfires and Climate at the Technical University of Crete since earlier in 2022. Uh, the AXA Research Fund is AXA's global initiative dedicated to accelerating risk science by funding top tier independent academic research in key areas related to health, climate and environment and socioeconomic risks. It also supports the dissemination of the research to inform decision making and address the most important issues facing our planet with the backup of excellent science. Over the last 15 years, the AXA Research Fund has been endorsed with 250 million euros and has supported nearly 700 projects and partnering with more than 330 leading academic institutions worldwide. The research of the AXA Chair in Wildfire and Climate that will be presented today is, and I'm sure you agree, of utmost importance for our society as wildfires have been drastically making headlines over the last years, just to mention California, Australia, Greece, Canada, France, and uh, are becoming a growing yet a poorly known threat. Wildfires represent a major challenge for our planet, for local authorities and for insurers due to the variety and magnitude of the damage they generate uh, to the environment, human livelihood, health, and just overall activity. At AXA Excel, we are currently sponsoring a project with Reading University and Leverhulme Wildfire Center. And I should mention that Apostolos is actually a founder of the center. And uh, this project I'm mentioning is focusing on building a model to assess wildfire risk on a global scale. So without further ado, um, if we move on to the next slide, I wanted to leave the mic to Dr. Vulgarakis, who will be pre presenting for the next 20 minutes or so on the latest science on wildfire and climate change, as well as the scope of the chair program that he will be leading in the coming years. Please feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Apostolos in the chat and we will have dedicated time to answer them until our session ends at 45 minutes past the hours. So Apostolos is all yours. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you for the for the very nice introduction. I hope I, I've unmuted now and you can hear me well. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it's really great uh, to be here um, and to discuss about wildfires and climate. Uh, it's also really a great to be sponsored uh, for the next five years in order to be able to go into more depths when it comes to the understanding of the linkages between wildfires and climate change. Uh, from where I'm based now in the last couple of years, the Technical University of Crete, after moving from uh, Imperial College. Um, and after 15 years uh, in various places abroad in the UK and the US as well. Um, so. Thank you for being here. Uh, what I'll uh, deliver is um, an accessible, hopefully, uh, presentation that will cover the following aspects that you see here. Uh, first of all, why are we interested in wildfires? Why is it something that uh, bothers us so much to the extent of um, having those um, uh, is funding directed towards it, as well as other efforts going on at the same time internationally that I can, I, I'll, I'll mention a few things about. What are the impacts of wildfires on the environment and on humans? Why are we interested in high latitude fires in particular? Because as you may have been, uh, uh, seen in the video that was shown earlier, high latitude fires 
uh, one of the main areas that um, uh, will actually dominate the agenda of what we want to study as part of this AXA chair uh, project, as well as global fires and fires in different parts of the world, which is generally speaking things that I've been doing over the years. Um, so, and finally, there will be some presentation of the actual scope of the AXA uh, chair program and some of the main workflow that we expect uh, will happen over the next um, four or five years. So why do we care about fire? So first of all, as you can see from this figure, which is based on uh, for, uh, on satellite information, and it's about the burn fraction in different uh, pixels around the globe uh, over a particular uh, period for which we have measurements. Fire is a disturbance agent that happens pretty much everywhere. So simply put, it's the greatest terrestrial disturbance agent in the world, in, in the globe. Uh, it's something that affects pretty much every vegetated environment on Earth. Um, of course, the tropics, as you see, is the epicenter of this activity, but we can definitely not say that other regions are not or have a minor problem because you can see how widespread white, uh, wildfire activity is. Um, in mid latitude regions and in high latitude regions too. And that has a lot of implications, not just for the Earth, but also about human uh, on human societies. Various sectors are affected. Some of them we've realized uh, that they are. Some of them we're starting to realize. Some of them not so much. Uh, policymakers, obviously, forest managers, uh, a wide array of industry related stakeholders, and that of course includes insurance because fires are something that is actually insurable right and causes a lot of damage at the same time so we have a problem that happens everywhere a problem that is um, particularly impactful but these impacts have been realized more and more in recent years i would say something like three to five years uh, now five years let's say um, we have been seeing um, in the news, like even if you don't care much about the actual science of wildfires, you will be seeing a lot uh, happening and in a very diverse range of locations around the world. That includes fires in traditional burning places like Mediterranean, California, Australia, but fires that are unprecedented in size and in destruction that they cause. Fires in tropical regions like the Amazon, for example, and fires in high latitudes like Siberia that are unprecedented in size. But even in areas like Greenland that is mentioned here, these are just some examples of um, headlines where fires actually didn't happen before. It's we have some first times uh, here. Also big fires in the UK in recent years um, and even this uh, last uh, summer in London, um, in, in the actual suburbs of London with a big heat wave. At the same time, there is a lot of um, uh, now movement in the scientific literature. So we have, it's, it's really surprising if you go 10 years back, further back, or even five, six years back, to see that in the high profile literature, it was quite rare to see an article that was focusing on wildfire related topics. Usually you would find uh, wildfire science in disciplinary journals. Uh, there was um, a, a, an appearance in 2018 of two iconic uh, pieces, views basically, uh, by high profile scientists, in this case, um, David Bowman, uh, about better data, better measurements, and at the same time, better models on wildfires. And that has accompanied the discussion about the devastation. And at the same time, my team and I and my collaborators were realizing and perhaps before that even, but it was good timing, that this is an issue that at the same time is very, very interesting and very puzzling scientifically. I'll move to the next slide. And here is the puzzle. That's a figure that um, I have used a few times uh, that um, we made in order to actually capture how it's a multifaceted phenomenon that can puzzle you in a variety of ways and that you have to attack it in a multidisciplinary fashion in order to be able to say that you've made a big difference in its understanding. So first of all, we don't understand very well the trends of fire. There is diverse um, uh, estimates of trends, even for the same location sometimes. There is uh, certainly uh, diverse trends even 
uh, amongst locations. So we have tropical areas, for example, that experience upward activity of fire, like in Southeast Asia and Indonesia, but then we have tropical savannas experiencing a decline. Contrary to common perception that fire is going up everywhere, there is several places where fire is going down. That's already a puzzle. At the same time, we have a lot of influences on things that I've been caring about for almost 20 years now, like atmospheric composition, climate, CO2 rise, contributions from fire, but how much there is a 15% figure uh, as an estimate, but that's a very uncertain number. And some of the most extreme air pollution events that humanity has ever seen have been observed in recent decades due to fires. When it comes to the ecosystems, some of them like fire, some of them don't. Uh, Mediterranean ecosystems, for example, um, will in many ways need fire to regenerate sometimes, something that we don't often understand in the way that we approach fires when it comes to um, managing them. And at the same time, there's ecosystems that will never recover when they get burned. They will be downgraded right away, uh, some of them in the tropics. Uh, and humans, you can say, are the biggest puzzle uh, in the sense that it's so hard to quantify uh, their interactions with fires and hard to understand. Uh, we have places where human influence on fire increases, places where it decreases, but even more importantly, despite the perception that we have, in, the, in especially in Western countries, that fire is always a bad thing. There is communities around the world, huge communities, especially in developing countries, where they rely on wildfire as a use, use it for especially a traditional agriculture. So very complex picture. I'll move to the next one. So we have, why do we care so much now? Uh, there are various reasons. So we're realizing as scientists, air system scientists like I am, I said I, I come from an atmospheric science, back, science background and that's what I still do along with the uh, understanding of fire and its interactions with climate. Uh, uh, we run global models and now regional models as well of atmospheric uh, composition, climate and couplings with fire. We have uh, also the costs of fire um, uh, damage uh, skyrocketing. Um, uh, the, uh, the tools that we have in order to model and predict fire are not necessarily um, a fit for purpose. Maybe unrealistic is too exaggerated, but certainly we have uh, limitations that are quite major. And at the same time, we have a lot of data coming in and both for field observations and from the lab and uh, even more importantly from Earth observation, more importantly in the sense that the revolution that's happening uh, from satellites is even more um, accelerated and the amount of data that we get not just on fires but on properties on which fire depends like for example vegetation aspects uh, are immense. The expertise is, is also um, available to a large extent in scattered places but we are mobilizing it through a variety of projects that we're starting including the Axature um, program project. Uh, in this particular AXA chip program, uh, we have three main um, um, three main goals, and and this webinar in a way serves also as a uh, as a communication uh, to the outside world of of um, or an initiator of the communication of those aims. Uh, one is to make a step change in the way that we model, the way that we understand first, and the way that we model wildfire and its impacts on the Earth system. Secondly, to focus a lot on uh, high latitude fires, as I mentioned, our research agenda is wide and covers uh, a wide range of, of activities on Mediterranean fires, tropical fires, global uh, studies, uh, but high latitudes uh, have started being and will be certainly in the future uh, a central focus along with uh, some key collaborators that we have been discussing about um, uh, this topic of uh, fire and high latitudes. And then finally, through interactions with uh, stakeholders, we want to generate knowledge, data and tools that will be useful to policymakers and the private sector and to society as a whole. So this, uh, we hope, will not be ivory tower research, but research in communication with stakeholders continuously. And I'll say more about it uh, potentially later. Now, what are the impacts of fire? Delving a little bit further, um, this is a figure that shows 
uh, the various impacts that you can have on atmospheric composition, which is uh, in many ways the central aspect of climate influences of fire on climate. So we have greenhouse gases like CO2 and also methane. We have other gaseous pollutants like CO, carbon monoxide or NO2, you know them as harmful uh, pollutants. Uh, those can also uh, produce ozone in the troposphere, which you possibly know is also a toxic pollutant and a greenhouse gas. And then we have also aerosols. What are aerosols? Quite likely you've heard of them uh, as particles that are suspended in the air and they're not gases, they're liquid or solid. And they uh, tend to have a quite strong effect on climate, especially regionally, but also if you integrate to a large extent uh, globally as well. Uh, fire will also affect vegetation, that will affect the surface albedo, the reflectivity of the earth, and all these things, given the aerosols and um, CO2 and methane and ozone, they're all, as we say, radiatively active species, all of these will affect radiation and therefore temperature and therefore a variety of things that depend on temperature, like the weather, like rainfall, and uh, a variety of things that with the winds, uh, things that we care about when it comes to climate modifications. But those have not been properly quantified. It's quite remarkable that in the IPCC there is no estimate of the radiative forcing that comes from fire. And that's not because the, the IPCC makes a tremendous effort, but the information is just not there in a systematic way. Next slide. Now, impacts on humans, I am um, showing you two slides and the first one is about public health uh, because that's something we've uh, also studied. Uh, that's with a, a PhD student I had a, when I was at Columbia University and, and NASA. And that's an estimation of what happens in Indonesia and Southeast Asia during an El Nino year. Why Indonesia? Because it's, a, it's an area that has experienced some of the worst air pollution events due to fires in recent uh, history in recent decades. Uh, the last major one was in 2015, but every year there is uh, this kind of situation, especially with El Nino. El Nino causes a lot of drought, is a climate phenomenon in the Pacific that causes a lot of drought uh, over the area, and that is, leads to fire prone conditions. And along with the human intervention, which pushes tor uh, towards land clearing, that can also cause a major effect. So what you see here basically is the estimates of two of the most important atmospheric models that we use. One is the GIS model, which is the NASA model that uh, I have been using. And to the right is the GSK model, which is the Harvard model that collaborators are, are using. And at the top, you see the concentration increases because of fires during a severe El Nino year. At the bottom, you see the exceedances of World Health Organization interim targets uh, because of the fires happening in those years. Pay attention to the numbers. We're talking about 50, 100, 150, up to 200 days a year where fire is actually exceeding um, uh, dangerous conditions. And we're talking about one region that is inhabited by many millions of people. So that's important for a big part of the population. And of course, that applies to other locations around the world, not necessarily exactly to the same extent but uh, as a quite important issue that is becoming worse and worse. Next slide, please. Now, yes, the, the other aspect, and in a way that encompasses many things, because everything uh, in a way directly or indirectly will fit, fit to the economy, but here we see figures about the direct damage from US estimates, which are the most thorough uh, so far, of different big fires, uh, the economic losses that were caused in dollars. You can see fires like the campfire, um, but you probably remember um, more than 10 billion of losses and, and many of them in recent years, which shows the magnitude of the problem. On the right, you also see the suppression costs. Uh, so how much the state is, um, the federal state is paying in order to, uh, to, to actually suppress those fires. You see increases that are again dramatic from 1 billion to 3 billion in, in the last um, uh, 30 years or so. That is not just because of fires becoming worse and worse a problem in the US, which is a case, but at the same time, it's also a result of this fixation we have been having over the last 
in, in the previous paradigm that's uh, hopefully will start being modified uh, of suppressing fires to an extreme um, level, basically trying to avoid any fire. It's we've realized as a community uh, is unrealistic and potentially dangerous. Can move to the next one. What does the future hold? Well, the future is not rosy. This is from a very recent report, um, which is on how the number of fires in this case will change for a mild climate scenario, RCP 2.6 on the left, and a more moderate uh, to severe uh, climate scenario, RCP 6.0. We start from the present day um, with a brown uh, bar, and then we see the different stages into the future. So almost up to or even more 50% uh, increases in the number of fires globally. So that definitely paints a picture that is somewhat grim and that needs a lot of attention both from science and from policy makers. Uh, let's move to the next slide. And what, what do we actually use to predict uh, fire danger, number of fires, burnt area, fire emissions? So stepping back, the traditional tool that has been used, especially operationally, but also scientifically, we've used it a lot even in recent things we've published, um, let's say for the future fire danger over Greece and other Mediterranean countries. We base those calculations on something called fire weather indices, especially the Canadian fire weather index, which is really established um, and basically takes into account just the meteorology, just what you see in the upper right corner uh, of this graph. So that means the rainfall, the temperature, the humidity, and also the wind uh, in order to estimate what's the fire danger and what it uh, will be in the next few days, for example, or even in climate change studies, how might the fire uh, danger change into the future? Now, another approach um, is to to actually start incorporating other factors like, for example, the underlying vegetation, because those fire weather indices take into account just the weather uh, and, and they've, they've been calibrated over certain regions. However, there is the option to make models that understand the variability of different factors that will modulate those relationships across the globe. The Inferno model is one model that we made uh, in collaboration with the Met Office, so my team at uh, when I was at Imperial, uh, we published that in 2016, and that's that's not the only global fire model that exists, it, but it's one of the main ones that take part in multimodal assessments and so on, and it's the first one that exists in the UK air system model. So that means that now there is a capability to predict how the future of the Earth and the climate might depend on the fire evolution of the future, while at the same time being a standalone tool that can be used for fire prediction alone at short or long time scales. Next slide, please. We can improve those models and we are doing that. That's from a paper we published uh, recently from with, with my team here, uh, with my colleague uh, Manolis Grilakis, um, and that basically uh, did a regression analysis to uh, examine what are the most important factors, meteorological factors in this uh, case, uh, in different parts of the world for estimating burnt area, for estimating what actually happened. So a retrospective analysis. You see in the order that uh, you see in the legend down, first, second, third, fourth, uh, the three meteorological, the four meteorological variables that we studied, temperature, precipitation, relative humidity, wind, and below there is also two drought indices that are commonly used. Um, don't pay too much attention to the details because we don't have time. But basically this study told us that, for example, uh, in almost all regions, temperature and relative humidity are the most important um, uh, factors. And through statistical analysis, not mechanistic and physical analysis in this case, and that helps us actually reflect, go back to the relationships that we have on the influences of fire weather and try and improve them for the different parts of the world, which will fit into the modeling that we do. Next slide, please. The, I think, it's, yeah, the previous one, yeah. So the other thing is that fire influences climate, as we saw in that schematic with all the pollution it causes. This is an example of a study that I, 
I, I really enjoyed uh, working on with my colleague Matt Kasor at uh, Imperial. Uh, and it's about uh, how El Nino, which is a major phenomenon and it influences weather around, um, around uh, the world uh, every year, how can that be modulated by fire? Basically, not to spend too much time, the two lines basically tell you that it does. So it's, it's really cool, I think, because it says that El Nino, which causes the drought and the fires that I mentioned before, will cause a lot of pollution that will then affect temperature and circulation and so on to an extent that El Nino will modulate itself through the pollution that it generates, something that had never been discussed before and something that has implications for forecasting the evolution of El Nino. So um, implications for prediction that is very valuable for the global community when it comes to predicting the weather of the coming weeks or months. Now, what about the high latitudes? So, high latitudes have a lot of um, a, a lot of a lot of tree burning and above ground vegetation burning, but they also have um, the uh, fires that happen in the soil, the pit fires as they're called, which are usually smoldering rather than flaming. This is a nice um, picture from uh, my good colleague Guillermo Rain, who is a collaborator also in the Axachair project. And he's a pioneer on the laboratory studies of how pit soils actually burn. And the loop that you see here is that climate change causes drier and warmer soils. Those soils are rich in organic content, which means they can burn. That causes to ignition and self-heating, smoldering fires, carbon emissions, and aerosol emissions and other things. And that can escape into flaming fires as well. So you can have a feedback between smoldering and flaming. Now with the high latitudes being areas that are uh, thawing, the permafrost is thawing fast, we expect this phenomenon to be accelerating into the future, but we have zero proper quantification of this. That can mean much more in terms of emissions of carbon in the future, much more in terms of aerosols, but what does that mean for the future of our climate? That is really at the core of what we want to do at the Axachair uh, project. Uh, you can move to the next one. Um, as I said, not the only thing because we're doing all sorts of um, global wildfire climate studies, but in particular this one, um, the purpose is to improve models through incorporating a lot of the knowledge that uh, is being gained from the lab, use machine learning tools that will help us actually with um, narrowing down uncertainty ranges and um, uh, coming, coming up with parameters that are more certain. And then understanding the role of those fires in present climate and predict the future in terms of what those uh, locations, the high latitude locations do, not just for high latitude climate, for, but for cl global climate as well. Next slide, please. One of the last things I'll say is that this work fits into a lot of international activities that are happening right now in various places in the world, um, with, I would say, maybe the most iconic one, not just because it's my baby, as Joanna said, uh, but until now, uh, it, it's the first effort that has tried to bring uh, the global study of fire and the multidisciplinary study of fire under one umbrella with many, um, more than 70 uh, people working as part of this Liverhome Center for Wildfires uh, for now. Um, and at the same time, many collaborators. Where I work now, the, um, the, the Technical University of Crete is the first officially affiliated organization of the center. So we're part of the Liverpool Center, which is based in London and uh, involves um, four main institutions, Imperial College, King's College, uh, University of Reading and Royal Holloway. And as you can see, there is a lot about studies everywhere, uh, North, Tropics, Global, also the WUI, Wild and Urban Interface. And the aims are to understand drivers of fire, be able to predict fire, quantify the impacts of fire, and be able to live more sustainably with fire. Obviously, the things I presented uh, will focus a lot on what I've circled there, or rectangled rather, so fire in the north and fire in global system. But what I'm trying to show you here is that there is a global community that is now uh, getting closer together, also in, in collaboration with other projects that are happening in other countries 
in order to, for the first time, join forces. And the AXA chair project fits very well into this community of people, if not being at the center of this community of people. Next slide, please. So finally, what do we aim to achieve in the future? So we aim to, first of all, um, um, uh, hopefully, or I won't say hopefully, because I do believe we'll manage that, uh, to lead to a further step change in our scientific understanding of wildfire, its drivers and its impacts on atmospheric composition and climate, especially through the study of uh, high latitude fires, to improve the tools that we have for predicting the Earth's future. And that means through predicting fire better, we can actually lead into knock-on effects on a variety of other systems that we want uh, to be predicting. Uh, and then, of course, to lead to better informed policy and industry, not just on wildfires, which is the immediate effect, but also on all those knock-on uh, effect sectors. So air quality policy and, and air quality prediction, climate, uh, insurance, agriculture, biodiversity, all sorts of areas that depend on fire can be modeled and predicted better and make better decisions if we have better tools for representing fires in those calculations. Uh, and then finally, through all this, um, uh, through all this new knowledge, new tools, um, hopefully the society through this study, but also through this project and also other uh, projects that are going on at the same time. Uh, hopefully in some years or a few decades from now, we'll be um, uh, ready to live more sustainably with fire rather than where we are now. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Well, many thanks Apostolos. Uh, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, I learned a lot, especially on improving existing models and wildfire weather, as well as the ends of feedback that you mentioned. So now on to Q&A. I think we have uh, several questions already, uh, and please continue to include those. Um, if we don't answer all of them now, uh, we may get to it a bit later after the seminar. So I'll start with um, the very first one. Is it possible to include human influences in fire modeling and forecasting? Okay, the answer is that uh, it's challenging, it's not easy. It's one of the most tricky aspects and it's the least understudied aspect so far. However, there are there is some movement towards that direction. So it's we're making baby steps, but those baby steps are recently accelerating. And I'll not tire you with uh, name dropping and mentioning uh, various projects, but I'll mention one that I think is the most ambitious one. Uh, it has been going for a couple of years now through the activities that we have uh, at the Liverham Centre that's based at King's College and I'm a collaborator in that. Uh, it's an effort to make the first agent based model of human fire interactions on a global scale. It's it's something that is by far the first time that this is being done. A, a huge meta analysis was involved of literature that exists for a variety of places around the world. And um, and we, we have some uh, evidence already that this has led to some improvements. And let's say again, what's this pace? Because uh, hopefully that's, uh, that'll be an area that will be developing quite uh, significantly in the coming years. So difficult, but we're working on that. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think this one is, is interesting. Uh, it may sound simplistic, but I, I assume it's difficult to answer. What is the proportion of man-caused wildfire versus natural wildfire? Oh, yeah, you, you nailed it. Uh, <laughs> not simplistic because it's difficult to answer. Uh, it depends really on the it depends really on the location of the earth. Uh, for example, I give you an example because um, high latitude fires is one of the main things of of this uh, Axotur ambition. We had the impression until recently that actually humans are not causing much in those high latitude locations, especially in Siberia. However, there is emerging knowledge now, especially from a review study that uh, happened recently, um, which gathers information even from fields that were not necessarily 
in touch with, uh, you know, immediately, which uh, demonstrates that actually is not a factor that should be neglected. So in terms of proportion, it's not easy to give uh, such, an, um, such an estimate. Um, sometimes the estimates, well, the, the feel that we have from what we hear in the media, certainly here in Greece, sometimes elsewhere as well, but I'll mention Greece because not only because it's one of the countries I know very well, but because there is an issue sometimes of, of um, uh, you know, conspiracy theories often gaining a lot of attention. And there is a, a common a common understanding um, or a com um, perception that fires are usually started by humans and it's always arson. Mm -hmm. That is not the case for sure. It's much more complex than that. It's quite easy, as you know, to to blame uh, to blame on one factor something that is rather complex. Um, certainly, humans are a big aspect, but it doesn't mean that fires wouldn't be happening, especially now in the climate change um, period. Yeah, I I see your point. Thank you. Um, another one would be: What are the key advances that could make wildfire forecasting better in the future, and how is your work contributing? So advances one is uh, for sure what I said earlier about humans, including humans. Uh, so that's something that um, is, is the newest and the one that is almost totally underdeveloped. We have included humans, but in a rather simplistic way or not included in the past. The other one is about going beyond fire weather. So fire weather is is valuable and it's the it's the the dominant thing you can say because that's the, the thing that gets modulated in on short time scales, especially and with climate change. So. The thing that changes from day to day, from week to week, is temperatures, humidities. It's not that the vegetation suddenly is going to change from day to day. Um, similarly, in the future, the, the most um, drastic thing that will change is temperature, hydrological cycle, and so on. But the underlying vegetation that you have is also very important. And that underlying vegetation will also change with climate change. And that's where models like Inferno, as I mentioned, and other global fire models are of great utility, especially as we improve them, because they're able to capture that connection. Now, with information that we have from satellites that now is in, on higher and higher resolution, let's say from the Sun Sentinel um, satellites uh, of ESA, and with clever methods, often involving machine learning in order to downscale that information and be able to uh, predict even at uh, several meters, you know, uh, resolution. Um, we can make advances when we know things about the fuel underlying through those satellite data uh, that, that will be quite drastic and that they will be able to simulate what happens, especially when yeah. it comes to extreme fires. Thank you. Thank you, Apostolos. Just looking at the time, I wanted to squeeze one more in, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, because this is kind of uh, something we're always often wondering. Do you think scientists and stakeholders work closely enough when it comes to the wildfire issue? And how will your project contribute to that? Uh, again, I think uh, baby steps, but but it does exist as a channel. Um, thankfully, I've, I've worked in places where this has been a thing, like for example, at Imperial College, there's also a lot of encouragement here being an applied school at the Technical University, being a tech school uh, to do this. Um, however, I think there could be, you know, we're busy people, all of us. It's hard sometimes to get us outside of our daily routines. But I think we're reaching an era where it's maturing as long as we're careful to do it in a way that is effective. So sitting down together regularly, not all the time, but at, you know, regular intervals, sharing what we need from each other is very, very important and where one can help the other in order to elevate uh, the tools that exist and, and at the same time the science that can be useful for uh, stakeholders. We are uh, actually um, planning with the AXA Research Fund that the next webinar that will happen will be exactly on this topic and um, involving more stakeholders for the topic of wildfires and climate. So again, I'll say what's this space? 
OK, so there will be a follow up. Uh, we all yes. look forward to that. Well, thank you very much. I think we're almost uh, at the time. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that the event has been recorded and will be available. Um, I believe um, on in about a week it will be on the uh, AXA Research Fund uh, website. Um, remember to watch this space for a webinar to follow up on this as Apostolos has mentioned and many thanks for this very interesting seminar. And I'll just um, thank you for joining and listening and hope to see you soon. So I'll close here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Bye bye. Bye.